Hi, my name is uh, Alex Simova and I'm a postdoc at the uh, Advanced Quantum Testbed. Today I'm going to talk about quantum imaginary time evolution on the Advanced Quantum Testbed. This is a work that uh, we have done with my friend and colleague Jean Louville, which is also a postdoc at the Advanced Quantum Testbed. Um, so this talk is organized as follows. First, I will talk a bit about quant like the, the Advanced Quantum Testbed uh, and our quantum processor, uh, and I will present uh, the KITE, or quantum imaginary time evolution, which is a quantum algorithm. I will then show you what happened when we try to run this algorithm. And the answer is that we get noise. And we have to deal with this noise in order to get a good result. Uh, I will show you like a technique to deal with this noise, which is called randomized compiling. And I will show that this can tailor the noise into something which is easier to handle. Finally, I will show you what result we get for the kite uh, when we use this error mitigating technique. So here is the quantum test bed uh, quantum processor. It's a superconducting circuit device uh, that you can see here. So it's eight qubits on a ring. And here I have from in, in red one uh, of the qubits. Uh, this is a, a close lookup. Um, and it's basically just um, a few micron uh, large um, capacitor uh, with a Josephson junction in between. So a qubit. Can, a qubit is a system with two states, 0 and 1. Um, but contrary to a classical bit, where you can only be 0 and 1 here, you can be a superposition of 0 plus 1. And, and this gives you that you can have all the states that are on this sphere, which is called the block sphere. Um, OK, so when we run something on the quantum testbed or on a quantum processor, usually we run a unitary, right? And a unitary um, is really just like a big matrix. Um, and the size of this unitary is given by 2 to the power of the number of qubits times 2 to the power of uh, the number of qubits. Uh, we cannot run this directly. We have to, to do what's called synthesis. And we have to construct a circuit that will, um, that will do this unitary. Uh, and so. The circuits have a few um, specific things, right? So you have to initialize it uh, in zero for each qubit. Here is a single qubit gate, and this is an entanglement gate. So a single qubit gate is basically a rotation on the block sphere, and an entanglement gate is kind of the same, but larger dimension, uh, and it's harder to represent. And finally, of course, at the end of your circuit, you have to measure it. And this is what I'm representing here by this. Um, I just want to mention that synthesis is actually hard. There is not a one-to-one -one mapping, and it's actually very important uh, for quantum computing to be able to properly map a unitary into a circuit. And we luckily have um, a synthesis tool developed by LBNL in the group of Kost and Young Koo, um, which developed very nice tools that we have used and worked with. OK, so now let's talk about quantum algorithm, and let's give an example of quantum algorithm. So I'm going to present the quantum imaginary time evolution, which comes from a classical algorithm called imaginary time evolution. The idea is the following. If you take an Hamiltonian, right, and you look at the evolution of a state under this Hamiltonian, you can write it as a sum on the Hagen basis like this. And, and it's just a sum of oscillating term with the Hagen state given here. And the trick of imaginary time evolution is to to switch the time for an imaginary time. And by doing so, you are just transforming all the oscillating term for, to dumping term. So now all the terms in this sum are just going to zero exponentially. And when you take the limit at infinite time, the one that goes the slowest to zero is actually uh, the ground state. So by doing so, by doing this evolution at infinite imaginary time, you just get the ground state. You can do this iteratively, and you get your algorithm. This have been already proved to be worker in classical computer and already been used. But uh, now we train to make it into a quantum algorithm. Uh, one thing that we have to be careful of, as Dan mentioned in uh, the previous talk, is that you, you cannot perform uh, non-unitary evolution on a quantum computer easily. Um, so the solution was found by Mota and others, uh, where basically you uniter unitarize each step. And this happened to be not too hard, as you can find the effective unitary evolution simply by solving some linear uh, system. 
So here is the workflow of the kite algorithm. So you start with a circuit, which is a description of your uh, algorithm after n step. You run it through your um, through the quantum processor, and you measured uh, some expectation value, or just measure a few observable on it. So you get this kind of array. Then you do the linear regression that I was talking about, which gives you uh, the unitary that you have to apply uh, in order to get to the next step. And then you use a synthesizer to construct the next circuit. So the constructing the circuit, as I said, it was not that easy. And we got a lot of help from uh, Ethan and Ed uh, using QSearch and QFast on this. So now let's try to apply this algorithm on a, on a system. So the example that I will take for all this talk is the quantum transverse field Ising model, right? It's a simple model uh, described here. So you, you have spin, which can be up and down and classically, so they can be also in superposition. They interact with, um, with a strength G along the Z direction, and they have a, a transverse field um, magnetic field, right, uh, in the transverse direction. And so this is a simple model that will allow us to benchmark our protocol and our processor. And if we run this, right, uh, we get this kind of, um, of curve where I have plot the energy as a function of imaginary time, right? And so I, each step, I'm just plotting the um, energy that I'm getting. I have shown here four experiments, and you can see that this is actually pretty bad. Um, you have a lot of jumps. So I'm doing four times the same experiment and I get different results and I, I have a lot of jump or noise. Um, and it, it's really hard to know if I have converged or not. It seems that I'm converging, right? But it seems that I'm going in the right direction, but I'm not converging. Um, and, and you can say, okay, maybe this is due to <laughs> your device is bad, but actually this is a more general problem of current quantum device. And, and current quantum devices are called NISC device or noisy intermediate scale quantum device. And in this name, there is noisy in it. And, and this is what I want to insist on. And this is why we have this kind of curve. Uh, so just, just to mention that right after me, there is a, a talk by Miro Urbanek uh, that will also talk about uh, noise in quantum processors. So I invite you to, to uh, listen to it. Um, so we are aware that we have noise. So usually we try to to, to give, um, to assess uh, what's the quality of a processor. As experimentalists, we try to give an idea of what will be the quality of a processor. And usually, like, it's well known that coherence is bad for quantum processor. So we try to give um, the quantum coherence time. So this is uh, an example of a table we give in article. Uh, this is taken from an article in the group. And, and we give the coherence time. So we have coherence time of a few microseconds. So a few 50 something microseconds or 100 microseconds. And basically, that's, this means that you have to do operation faster than this time before all the information uh, get out of a processor. To measure this, usually what we do is that we prepare one and, and we wait um, for the information. For, we wait for the state to decay into zero. So this is uh, the T1 time. Sadly, now, if you look um, at what limits this gave us, right, if we try to see how much, uh, what circuit depths we can do with this coherence time, we see that we can do a few thousand of single qubit gate or a few hundred of entanglement gate. And actually, this is much a much bigger number than the one that I was, the one of the number of gates that we had in the circuit I was showing you before. In the circuit I was showing you before, we were doing three entanglement gates, not a hundred. Um, so we cannot explain the performance of our device with just the coherence noise. And this is something that really is important in current device. Coherence is not always the limiting factor. So there is luckily um, another way to evaluate the performance of a quantum processor, which is called randomized benchmarking. Uh, and this is also, we usually give it uh, in this table. Um, and the idea of randomized benchmarking is that you construct a circuit with n random Clifford circuits. So each of those blocks here is a Clifford. Clifford is just a specific circuit. And you just measure the success probability as a function of the, of the depth of your circuits. And, and 
due to some property of the Clifford uh, gates, right, you can you, you can say that you will have a single exponential decay, and this single exponential decay um, can be used as a figure of merit of your processor. So this is uh, I've been like quite a, a nice tool to actually assess the performance of of quantum device. Sadly, it is not enough. Again, if we use this metric uh, to uh, assess the performance, we, we don't get, uh, we should be able to do more gate and we should, should get better results than what I, I showed you before. So quantum bench, uh, randomized benchmarking is a good tool, but it's not always reliable to, uh, to, to estimate the performance of a given algorithm. Um, so the question is still there, like why do we have so erratic results? Why do we have all those jumps? And, and to explain this, I would like to, to take a step back and look at a very simple set. So here I'm just doing a single qubit circuit where I'm doing four time, four time uh, a, a pi, pi over two rotation along the x axis. Um, so if you look in the block sphere, you have this kind of block sphere. So you start in zero, and then at the first gate you, you end up in this direction, right? So you do pi over two rotation along x. And I'm doing this four times. So in blue, it's each step. And so the final state is exactly the one that I started with. So this is if I have a perfect quantum computer. No, if I have incoherence, what happened um, is that I will start to, the, the length of the vector will be smaller and smaller. And so I just end up with a vector um, at the end of the circuit when I measure, I will end up with a vector which is exactly uh, in the same direction, but which have a length radius. This is not such a big issue because I can just uh, renormalize my vector and I get back um, my state. And now I will present like the worst kind of error that we have on a processor and it's called coherent error. Um, and basically this is just because of miscalibration or because of crosstalk or something that is badly controlled, um, we are starting to have small coherent error. So on a single qubit, this will be like a, um, a small over rotation, right? And so when I do just one gate, I have a very small error. So you can see it here. But as I do more and more gates, I start to accumulating this error. And this is really why coherent error are bad for quantum devices, because you can accumulate coherent error. Um, and, and what is worse is that uh, this accumulation, the way the error is accumulated, depends on the circuit layout that you use, right? So now if I change circuit, I will have a completely different uh, error, accumulation of coherent error. And this actually explains why we have jump. We have jump because we, in every point, we actually have a different circuit, and this circuit uh, realizes a different noise pattern, and we get uh, jumpiness because of this. So one way to deal with this is called randomized compiling or poly twirling. And the idea is to just use several unitaries that realize, uh, sorry, use several circuits that realize the same unitary. There is a few properties that you have to be taken care of. Uh, and you can read the paper by Joel Wallman uh, that, that proposed this method. And then you just average all this outcome of those random circuits that realize the same unitary. And what you do is, is given here. So here in blue are all the results of noisy circuits, uh, but, um, run, but doing the same unitary. And when you average all of them, you see that the red, you get the red row. And the red state you see is much like the, the direction is much better than the blue one. Um, but you pay a, a price to do this is that you just have less length. No, you have reduced the length of the vector. And so this is basically what um, randomized compiling gives you. It's like it's average results. It's, it's average out the coherent accumulation of error, uh, but you lose a bit um, by just reducing the length of the block vector. And this can be generalized to multidimensional. We recently uh, published a paper on the archive um, that you can find here by um, Akalashim and others. So uh, let's let's try to, to dive in, uh, describe a bit more what happened uh, with uh, randomized compiling. So let's take just a bunch of uh, circuits and, and do randomized compiling on them and look at the error that we get. So here I'm plotting uh, the error, the mean error that I get on the circuit, on the outcome of the circuit, as a function of the ideal value. So expectation value can be minus one or plus one. And uh, I'm just plotting this, uh, the error as a function of this quantity. So this is what happens if you have a perfect thing. 
And if I don't do randomized compiling, I have a very flat error, right? All the, whatever is the expectation value, I should get uh, uh, the same kind of error, right? Um, but now if I start to do randomized compiling, so let's take the green curve, I start to see a appearing like some kind of V shape. And V shape uh, is a so-called depolarization model where where basically this is what I was telling you, that we are just reducing the length of the block vector in the bigger space now um, of the two qubit space. And this works also for, for more dimension. And, and because we know that we have approximately this kind of error, we can try to remove it. And, and removing it means just subtracting uh, this uh, v-shape and when we do so we have this kind of error so we are just renormalizing the block vector and this is uh, a process which is called a purification in a, a quantum computing because what we do is that we take a, a state which is not a pure state it's a mixed state because it don't have a length of one and we purify it to make it into a pure state this is the naming and and we see now that uh, when we do purification, we get very much flatter error rate um, as a function of the ideal value. And you see, but you see something important is that uh, as you as you do randomized compiling, you you get an error, uh, a mean error which is much lower. And and this is the advantage of using randomized compiling rather than you not choosing it. So <clears throat> so just. Um, this is an approximation, like the depolarization noise is an approximation, uh, but it's it's work well uh, for our device. Uh, and, and it seems that purification is a technique which is well known and you can use even without randomized compiling, but it gives you better results when you use randomized compiling. And you tell all the noise into a noise which is better, easier to handle. So we have tried to, uh, to just investigate the behavior uh, of this technique uh, when we increase the depth of a circuit, so I was showing you just a three C naught depth. Now, if I increase the depth of the circuit, um, and I'm just repeating random circuit, uh, you can see here in blue the result with randomized compiling, and this is just a fidelity. So it's it's just uh, how close I am to uh, to my ideal output. One means that I am exactly on it. Um, so this is the thing, and and you see in orange. Uh, that this is a purified result. And you can see that the, the purified result is actually quite good, even for very large uh, depths, um, which is quite good. This means that our error mitigation technique works for uh, a lot of circuit depths, which is quite important. Here, I have tried to plot the origin of error, right? So you have two kind of origin of error. If you think of the single qubit picture, you have the length of the block vector, which is easy to correct, and you have the angle error, which is hard to correct, and which is hard to, sorry, to mitigate after. Um, and you can see that with randomized compiling, actually the origin of error is like, the, the, the length of the vector is the dominant error, uh, is the dominant error, and the angle error is quite small. Uh, and that's why uh, the purification works as a technique. So just, I was talking about randomized benchmarking and telling you that randomized benchmarking is not super predictive yet. Actually with randomized compiling and um, a variant and randomized benchmarking, which is called cycle benchmarking, we start to have very good prediction of what an algorithm will do. And this is shown by the dashed curve here. So the dashed curve are not fit. They are uh, model predicted with cycle benchmarking. And, and if you want to know more, you can look at this article. Um, but under randomized compiling, quantum processor behave much more predictable than uh, usual because you are averaging out the square error uh, and it's easier to estimate what will happen without this uh, current accumulation of error. So finally, we, we can now play and go back to a quantum algorithm and run it. So this is um, the kite algorithm, once again, on the on the left, I'm showing you the first initial result. And on the right, I'm showing you a three qubit um, transverse Ising field model. So where you have used, where we have used randomized compiling and a purification. This is just a, a generalization of the purification to a higher dimension. And now you see that I have changed the X scale to a log scale because now we have much better results. So this is the uh, error, error 
this is the energy and we see that we are this is the error on the energy and you see that we are uh, close to the right energy of the ground state up to 10 to the minus 3 10 to the minus 2 here and and we have the ground state infidelity uh, to also 10 to the minus 3 so we are not pretty good um, on those things um, what is nice with random mass compiling is it's not too hard on the hardware so we can run a lot of those experiments and this is what we have done and try to show case uh, some uh, files diagram even if it's just three uh, three sites so in the points are all experimental points here uh, they are just experimental data they are not theory and the point represents um, so the energy of the ground state and the first excited state as a function of uh, a parameter which is the, the transverse field in the Ising model and in solid line you have the theoretical prediction or the ideal value and you can see that we are right spot on it uh, here i have plotted the absolute energy error and you can see that we are in the range of 10 to the 10 to the minus 3 to 10 to the minus 4 uh, uh, for this uh, estimation we are also able to uh, to get the ground set pretty precisely and and finally which is also very important we are able to measure observable like magnetization uh, for the state and we also have a really good agreement uh, with what it should be so as a conclusion i hope that i've shown you that error on this device are a major issue right uh, and it's important but with proper error mitigation you can still run and have good results and I hope that I have shown you that randomized compiling allow you to tell all the noise and make purification a good uh, mitigation strategy. Finally, uh, future future direction, we have uh, like the purification is a pretty rough, uh, pretty easy and simple um, way of error mitigation. And we are working with Samuel Ferrassin and uh, Joel Wallman at uh, benchmark, uh, quantum benchmark in order to use more elaborate mitigation scheme. Uh, we are also working with Gung and Gilung and LBN in order to try to have more efficient hardware to do randomized compiling. So with this, I would like to thank uh, Jean Louville, uh, which who is here, which have helped, which actually is uh, half of what, like, sorry, which is like one of the main um, investigator on this project. I would also like to thank uh, Ravi and Akel that have helped a lot. Uh, I would like to thank Joel Wallman that uh, helped a lot with the theory, Ethan and Ed, which have helped us with the synthesis, and Costin also that have helped us with the synthesis. And with this, I, I thank you for your attention, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will answer them right now.